Okay, guys, let's go and kick off. Thanks for joining us today for our 10 fundraise launch program. This is designed to help those who are getting ready to raise a fund round. And we're here to help with that. We have templates, we have tools, we have e-guides, we have advice, and we also have a short presentation. We'll kick off the session, take about 10 minutes to walk through. So if you're putting a pitch deck together, this is for you. And if you already have put a pitch deck together, this is for you to check and see if you have all the slides in there that you need for what you're doing. As we go forward, if you want to go ahead and post uh, potential questions in the chat box, like I say, this will only take 10 minutes. Uh, we can go further for the rest of the hour if you need to answer anybody's questions. But uh, put your questions in there as we go, and then we'll answer them in the order in which they come in. So with that, let's go and kick off. Uh, I'm Hall Martin with 10 Capital. I founded this company in 2009 under the name Texas Entrepreneurs Network, and we're here to help uh, startups raise and funding and connect with investors. And one of the key ways to connect with investors is to have a good pitch deck put together that provides contacts, tells a story, and convinces the investor you have it together. So with that, let's go ahead and look into it. In your pitch deck, there's basically one slide for each section of the business. It's 12 to 15 slides in most cases. Uh, you don't need 40 or 50 slides. Investors can't take in that much information in one sitting anyway. And so the pitch deck is basically your executive summary. It's basically your business plan in a nutshell. And the key thing to remember is this, the deck is not your presentation. You are the presentation. The deck is there to help you tell the story with key information. So if you're putting on the slides everything you're saying uh, word for word, well, you're duplicating. You shouldn't uh, have to put everything on the slide that you're saying because you're already saying it and so forth. The other thing you want to make clear of is that the deck needs to be visually compelling. If you can say something with a picture, image, graph, chart, or whatever, instead of words, then do so. It really helps communicate the message a lot more clearly than if you put everything in text words on the screen itself. So we'll go to the next slide here. And so on your first slide, put up there your logo, your company name, and your tagline. Your tagline is your mission, your mantra. It's what you do in five words or less. It's something that says something about your business. It's, start, it's important to start telling people what you do in different ways. And so make sure you put this up there in big, bold letters and fonts so people can see it from a distance. Uh, in Zoom calls, oh, yes, we're all right up close to it, but in but other not places, we're not. Did you read this? He came to a kitten. Are so next, next slide up. He said. Is your company description. Here she what you're doing is introducing your company. And in a few words, or you're trying to explain what your business does, who for whom, and why. And the key here is to start giving context about what area you're working in, what market you're working in, what problem you're solving, and who are you helping. I find as an investor, it's very hard to understand a, a pitch deck or deal with it until I know what they do, uh, specifically what sector, segment, product, problem. When I have that, then it starts to, everything else starts to make sense and fit in as we go forward. So you want to put that together in a short format as well. Next one up is let's talk about talk about the problem you solve specifically and start putting in their information about what is this problem and why it needs to be solved and so forth. And it's important to make clear that this is a big problem. You're solving something that costs people a lot of dollars or a lot of time, and you're there to help reduce it. Solving somebody's problem by only a few percent, you know, unless it's a very, very big problem, it's really not going to be compelling. You have to be you know, making a, a significant impact into that as well. So let's talk, so talk about the problem you're solving there and identify the pain that the customer is feeling in what they're doing there. The next slide is your solution. And here, this is often uh, about your your technology or your approach or how you're going to be bringing it to the table and this is one of the most important slides because this is really your intellectual property this is your value proposition this is what you're bringing to the table so you want to spend a little bit of time in figuring out what that is and how to explain it to people in a short format word and so you want you want to make clear of is that this is a business worthy solution and you've got a solution for their problem that they have there. 
And then the next slide, and this is the one that's most often missed in Dex, is what exactly is your product? In five words or less, can you tell me what your product is? And can you put a picture up there? If it's a mobile app, show a, show a mobile phone with a screen of the app. If it's an enterprise software, show a picture of that as well with the screen to show something about what information you're taking in and working with on there. The key is you have to make clear what is your, the product itself so people get a sense of, of what it is, how it works, and how people use it. And if you can put a picture up there, I find that that communicates a lot right away. So now we know what we have and where we are going with it as well. Next up is your value proposition. Here you want to start going into the details of more details of your solution and start talking about what are the benefits of using this product or solution and what the customer gets from it. And then make a, a clear, concise, uh, focused uh, presentation. <clears throat> Many companies have multiple products and ancillary solutions and so forth, but in these decks, you want to always focus on the core. And then that's because people have to understand the core of it before they can get to the, uh, the variations and the other things that you may be offering. So always focus on the core information. In this case, focus on the core value proposition. Are you saving them time? Are you saving them money? Are you saving them reputation? What are we actually helping them with that they want so that they want this uh, uh, solution that we're offering out there? And next up is you start talking about how your business works and what you want to do here is make clear to people that we've got a process for how the business works. In some cases, it's not just an, an app or a piece of software. It's a full process. It's a service. It's something that they give us information. We, we uh, put it in a database. We analyze it. We give them the solution back. And you want to start breaking down what you're doing so people understand uh, exactly what is going on in a more detailed way. If, the rule of pitching here is if you don't mention it, it doesn't exist. So if you don't make clear what your process is, people may not fully grasp all the work that you're really doing for the price that you're charging. So it's important to do that as well. So the next one is, is to talk about your go-to-market plan. How are we going to get into the market? What channel are we going to use? What channel are we going to use to generate leads? And where are we going to find our initial customers? Uh, the, the, the worst thing you can say is we've got a very large market here and we're going to take 1% of it. The problem with that is it doesn't tell the investor anything about how you're going to go after that market. It doesn't tell them where you're going to start, how you're going to proceed. And it's very important to give a very good specifics about it. An ideal way is to say, here are 20 initial customers we're going to go talk to. Oh, by the way, we've already talked to them and they love what we're doing and they're ready to buy. This is the kind of thing that investors really get excited about because it shows you're in tune with the market and you know how to get into it. Many of these markets are very large. You can start in many different ways and the investors are trying to figure out what is your approach to that market as well. And then the next one is the market size. And what we want to do here on the market size is to showcase uh, the market in three dimensions. One, what is the total available market? If everybody in the world could use it, how big would that market be? And this needs to be in the multiple billions of dollars. Next is the serviceable market. This is the market that you're actually going after. And it's also needs to be a big number, but it's going to be much smaller because it's going to be the target that goes around what you're trying to do in this time frame. And then the third is your beachhead market. And the purpose of this is to showcase, we know where we're going to start. We know who the first 20 customers are. And there's a reason why we're going after this segment. It's easier to penetrate, has less competition. Uh, we have uh, better connections. It can be many reasons why you pick it, but you want to show how you've got an entry into the marketplace and how you're going to use that to get into the rest of the market as well. So show the size of your market, and if you can show growth rates and some other detail, that's great too. But these are the three things investors are going to be looking for. Next up is the competition. Uh, you don't see competition slides as much as you did before, but I think it's still important to put in there that you recognize there is competition out there and you, you have a chart or graph or table or something that shows who the competitors are. And I find one reason this is a very useful tool is as an investor, I, I learn more about 
what segment of the market you're going into by the, the list of competitors than I do by the market slide we just looked at. The market slide is just to say it's a big market. This slide actually tells you which market you're going after. And in some senses, uh, for many investors, the competition validates the market. If there are other people going after it, there's money there to be made. If no one's going after it, then there's no money to be made. So you find the competition slide is an important one to put in there. Don't leave it out because investors are going to be afraid of competition. Many look at competition as a great validator, but then show how you're you're better than the competition. What figures of merit are you using to say, hey, we're better than what these other guys are doing? The next slide is the traction slide. This is what you have going so far. What kind of uh, audience are you building? What kind of engagement are you getting? What kind of revenue traction are we seeing? And whatever you have is important to put up there that you're making progress with the customers. And so traction slides are very important. Even in the early stages, you want to show that you are out there engaging with customers and you're succeeding at some level with it. Uh, next one is slide revenue. This is where we actually start getting into how much are we bringing in in the way of revenue, costs, and profits, just three lines. This is the financial slide where people often just cut and paste a big block of uh, sales from their Excel spreadsheet into the slide. The problem with that is it's almost unreadable when it gets that much up there. About as much as you can put up there for financial data is about three rows of numbers. And then add a, a graph, either a bar chart or line chart that uh, visualizes those, those three numbers to show where you're going. And the purpose of this is this is to do, say, this year, last year, this year, and the next three years, so you have a five-year window on it. The purpose is to show that uh, you, you know, you, you're showcasing what you think the growth rate's going to be based on the fundraise, when you're going to cash flow positive, what slope are we putting on that curve, and where have we been before, just to give it context. So do last year, this year, and the next three years gives you a five-year window, and that should give you some uh, bearing around what you're actually proposing is going to happen with the funds raised there as well. And next one up is uh, many people have a vision around what their product is going to do, but it may not be all the way there today. We're just now starting. So put out a platform roadmap. What do you think the product will be in the coming years? I meet many entrepreneurs who are building a, a service company today with the idea that they're going to collect data and monetize the data in a few years, and then they're going to turn it into an AI, an AI system uh, a year after that. Well, showcase that service data AI to show that you're on the track to get an AI business out of it, because you'll find your valuation goes up by an order of magnitude for each of those steps going forward. And if you plan to do that, go ahead and telegraph that as a visionary statement to say where you're going to be with it. The next slide is your team slide. This is where you want to highlight the founders and the team. And if you have advisors, put them on there as well. And the key is to put their name, their title, and any projects or companies they work with that are relevant to this industry. Keywords will, will shine a lot bigger than detailed bios or whatever. Nobody can read the detailed bios. So just put the big words up there that showcase that you have an experienced team and everyone has industry knowledge is what investors are looking for in this case. Next slide up is if you have a board of directors, go ahead or board of advisors, go ahead and put them up there. If you're very early, uh, go ahead and combine it with the previous slide just to make the team look better, bigger. Advisors are often brought in to fill gaps on the team that aren't there. There's no one uh, for finance, so let's bring in an advisor who can stand in for the finance role. In the early days, we need a little bit, but we don't need a full-time person for it. Advisor is a good solution for that as well. And then the next one is your fundraise slide. And what you want to do here is actually show how much you're raising, how much has been raised so far for the business, if any, and then how much has been invested in the previous business uh, before this, this round. So if I'm raising a million dollars, I have 500K raised so far. That means I'm halfway to my goal. And if in previous rounds, I have $2 million into the business. That gives the investor some idea of how much investments have, has gone in already and at what stage of the, the process you should be at at this point. And then the last slide is the exit strategy slide. And this is 
what do you expect the business to become? You Are you planning to go IPO, planning to go public with the SPAC, planning to keep the business for 10 years? What, what do you think the business will become? And how do you think that you'll be able to pay back the investors? And you're looking at similar comps or exits in the industry related to yours to show people that uh, businesses buy the startups like uh, like the one you're building and show the vision that we are going to be like them as well. So you have to have, you want to showcase that you, you have the exit in mind, even though we really can't get too detailed about it at this point. So those are the, the major slides to put in it. If you, we have a template with this, if you would like to have it, just send us a note in the chat box and we'll send you the template that you can use. The key thing I always tell people about a slide deck, the way you want to approach this is take the template. On each slide, go through and write out on the slide the three messages you have for each of those slides. Before you sit down and start building the slides, think about what you want to say. What is your message? What is your content? If I'm putting metrics in there, which three metrics do I want to use? Once you have that, then go back through and start wordsmithing the bullet points into graphs, charts, and other things so it, make, it's, it's, it looks good. And then practice it, walk through it, and do a, a, a dry run through the presentation and see if it flows. If it doesn't flow, you may have to move some slides around so your story carries all the way through. So the key is to figure out what you want to say and then start to build that in there as well. So great. Um, I see a couple of you guys like to get the uh, template. Great. We'll send that to you. Uh, who has a question about your deal and about pitch decks? And then after that, we're going to ask if you have a question about anything related to launching and running a fundraise, uh, fundraise amounts, milestones, approaching investors, all of that's fair game today. So just let us know what you would like to talk about. Uh, hi, I have a question about uh, the valuation because that is mostly, I think, a critical point that investors would like to talk about. And um, we, for example, we uh, calculated a discounted cash flow model based on an average what peers, what our peers are making in the market because we do not have revenue at this point. And that was highly controversially seen by uh, some of the investors we talked to. And right. is there any, any better approach that we could take? Sure. Uh, unfortunately, at the very early stage, especially pre-revenue, you'll find the traditional valuation metrics such as discounted cash flows, book value, asset value, they don't really apply because you don't have cash flows yet. And forecasted cash flows are, are just very hard to get everyone to agree upon. And so in the early stage, we're using other valuation metrics to go after it. The two that we'd like to focus on is number one, what we call comparables. And what you want to do is look at similar companies like you were doing with your example there. But instead of looking at their cash flows, look at their valuation. Uh, look at where they are today and what valuation they're getting and then work back from that to where they were when they were your stage, when they were pre-revenue, what valuation were they using? Uh, what were they doing at that stage? So you can you want to look at similar companies, but you, you can't use a later stage company that's similar to yours uh, valuation. You have to use this, the valuation they used when they were at your stage. Now, another approach to this is what I call the rule of four. The rule of four valuation says, give yourself $1 million of valuation for each of four things, sales, team, product, and fundraise. And if you have sales fully in place and everything's working and revenue's coming in, give yourself a million dollars. If you have the product, it's fully in place, everything's working, give yourself a million dollars. If, on the other hand, your product is not fully in place, it's not shipping, it's not final, but maybe it's in beta, well, then give yourself a portion of it, say 500K. And then look at the team. If you have all the positions covered for the executive team and everyone's in place, a million dollars. Well, maybe you only have two out of the three people, so let's give ourselves $600,000 for the team. And then the last one is intellectual property. If you have everything filed and awarded as patents and uh, technology, intellectual property, well, then give yourself a million dollars. 
If you filed three provisional patents, then let's give ourselves, say, $250,000. So the idea is you're articulating the values that are in the business today, and you're putting a value on it dollar-wise, and then you add up all four to get your valuation. Now, in today's market, the market's at a very high place, and so what you'll find is that uh, you, you're, you're sometimes past that rule of four, and I call that that delta the speculation factor. If I add up my four numbers and I come out with $3 million, but I want to put a $5 million valuation on it, then $3 million are the value in the business and $2 million is a speculation. And now when you talk to an investor, you want to talk about what's in the business today and you want to highlight what values are there. If you don't mention the team, you don't get the credit for it. I will say no matter what number you put on the table, investors will challenge it. So you must always be able to defend it and to talk about how similar companies at your stage got that valuation to use a rule of four where you identify the specific things in the business, the team is together, the product is working, the intellectual property is filed. It, it starts to make uh, a more defensible valuation itself. And, and finally, with valuation, it's a negotiation, not a formula. Yes, we use formulas to come up with numbers, but in the end, it is a back and forth. It is a compromise uh, that helps when you go into a discussion with investor mentally. If you realize this is a negotiation, it's not everybody's going to agree, but we will come to a uh, compromise into a solution at some point. It will take some time and you will get there. The key is to actually have uh, hard value adds in the business to put on the table rather than uh, I just think I'm worth it because that that ladder is really not very compelling. So those are my suggestions. What questions did you have for me, Jake? Uh, that was pretty good. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, in fact, uh, we are in a situation right now where we probably need to also look at uh, the amount of funding that we require to fulfill all our uh, milestones that we that we have set for our company especially in terms of marketing expenditures. Uh, marketing a brand new product is, is very expensive. And if an investor gives you $1 million and you do the kind of marketing that we are envisioning, then we're burning through that $1 million in one year. And uh, so it's, it's really here the difficulty to uh, agree to, with an investor to agree in some sort about what we need uh, what we need, we think, is at least $3 million and then come up with a valuation that would actually allow to raise $3 million um, even before we have revenue. And, and that's difficult. But yeah, thank you for the inputs. We will all try to work it out a bit better. Sure. So, so on fundraising, what we always talk about is milestoning out the fundraise. It, typically, if you're going to market without a product or it's even a pre-seed product, you're raising around 250 or 500. If you're in, going into the market with a product, you're raising 500 to 750. And partly because your valuation is going to be the lowest it will ever be up front. And so you want to raise, think about raising the minimum amount you need to get to the next level, not the maximum amount, because the more you raise at this early stage, the more equity you're giving away. And so you want to scale it back, scale back features, marketing, et cetera, to do just the very basic things that you need in order to stand up the product, stand up the customers and get the thing going. And then raise the majority of it on the next or third round when your valuation starts to go up. As you add product, team and revenue to the uh, process, your valuation takes stair step functions up. And that's where you want to raise the majority of it. So mostly what you want to be thinking about is uh, how much can I do with 250, 500K on the first round to get out there? And then when my valuation jumps up, now I can then start to use discounted cash flows. Now I can use comps from other companies that are growing just like I am. And the valuations will be much higher and it'll be a lot easier to raise 750, a million, and then on up after that because you've uh, you've not taken a big hit in equity up front itself. So consider milestoning it out and thinking about minimal minimal minimizing uh, funding as opposed to maximizing funding. Uh, also because you'll you'll spend a lot more time raising funding if you set the goal at a million rather than five hundred. Set at five hundred, you'll you'll spend less time on that and more time on the business. 
Okay, well, thank you. That makes good sense. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Jake. Anybody else have a question? Hal, could, could I ask a follow-up question to that? Yes, Fred. What, what's your question? So, so what if uh, you're so look, taking a look at your rule of fours, which I, I really like, by the way, but um, if you're really starting to do really well on the revenue side and customer acquisition, so let's say you got from 500000 to a million dollars in revenue in the last quarter uh, with you know a two hundred dollar per customer um, uh, average revenue, do you think that rule of four can be extended a little bit if you were going to raise a million dollars as far as as getting uh, valuation for the company? Yes, you can extend it up if you start uh, signing up recurring revenue, you know ARR contracts with clients, and you now have. 10 clients signed up. Well, then now we're going beyond the $1 million. Now we're coming out of the, the early stage seed where we don't have any revenue or just a little bit to having substantial revenue. And you can actually raise that up. One of our calculators, the venture funding calculator, actually uses that model. And so if you go to the 10 Capital site under education, go to eGuides, and there's a calculator section. What you'll find is that there's a calculator where you can type in what your current revenue is, and it'll, it'll give you a valuation number. Of course, that, that will vary a little bit from one industry to the next, but you can see that the rule of four can uh, extend upwards. We right. came up with it when we were dealing with pre-seed companies, and you know, a lot of the value was around the team and the idea and the product, not the not the actual revenue. But as you go past it, uh, more and more, the, the revenue starts to drive the valuation. At, and at some point, either revenue or EBITDA will be driving the valuation. So if you're moving from 500K to a million and, and beyond, you're, you'll see that the valuation, uh, the rule of four, the, the revenue will really start to, to dominate the, the valuation calculation. But check out the calculator and let me know how close that comes out with what you are envisioning. And we can have another discussion about that as well. Okay. And, and more specifically, the question was about the, the rate of increase, right? Uh, and also, so we're going we're gonna to be hitting 500 customers by the end of the quarter, first quarter, probably 1,000. That I just want to make sure that that's that rate of increase is, is uh, accounted for what I think the, the valuation should be. Right. And then this is where comparables also come into place. If you look at companies in a similar mode, uh, what were they raising at? What was their valuation at? And then at some level, you can work back from exits. When you go from an exit back, you can figure out what did, how much are they paying for a dollar of revenue? How much is the valuation per, per customer? Whatever the driving number is. And these are the things we need to start figuring out. If primarily, there are some tools like PitchBook and CV Insights and so forth that tell you that. But, but a lot of that really just comes out of the industry, talking to people that were related to it. So I would start to talk to people about what the similar companies are doing, because that's going to be even more compelling than the rule of four calculator for sure. And the deck itself, would you recommend that's always delivered in a meeting, never uh, recorded? I mean, we've had some investors that says, can you send me your deck? Would you not, would you recommend against that and always schedule a presentation? Uh, I think in today's world, you, you, you should put a good deck together and send it out to those who are seriously interested, <laughs> uh, a lot of investors will, will have a hard time knowing if they're interested, you know, you know, to take a call unless they see the deck and they start to see the, these, uh, you've got traction, you've got a great team, you're starting to hit some of their points. So I believe you send out the deck in advance to get people interested in what you're doing and show that you have a quality deal here especially if you're coming over the transom. If someone is introducing you, a warm introduction and so forth, it's possible you could set up a meeting and then show the deck at that point. I do think some people read the deck in advance and they come prepared because they, they have done a little bit of homework up front. They won't do a lot, but they'll do some. And that's always a good sign as well. Thank you so much. That's great. Okay, cool. So Hall, we have uh, two questions from Glenn. So follow up on valuation. So what are your thoughts on safe notes? And then what are your thoughts regarding hockey stick like revenue and profit forecasts? 
Great. So, so safe notes are, are commonly used today. Uh, it's very, you know, we used to use convertible notes and now we use safe notes and what a safe note is essentially a warrant, you know, it's the right to buy the stock in the future. Uh, convertible notes and safe notes have pluses and minuses, but they're, they're pretty minor. Most people use safe notes in the very early stage because you don't really need a heavy legal component to it. Uh, investors, for the most part, just want to be in the deal, and so they'll sign those. The key with a safe note is to have a valuation cap. If you go in with an uncapped valuation, which means the you know the the future round can be any anything, that that that's very hard for many investors. They want to see a valuation cap, and like I say, they're really not going to argue too much about it because it's just the way to get in the deal. And then in future rounds, if we're going really well bigger dollars will come in on the priced round when that, that appears, but they'll put in a little bit at this stage just to have a seat at the table. So safe notes are, are very uh, commonly used at this point and haven't really had much pushback on those. There are some investors that want equity. And my rule is if they're going to put a hundred thousand dollars or more and they want equity, well, they're a candidate to be a lead investor to price the round. And I'm always open to pricing the round, even the early days. If you want to price it, that's great. If uh, they, they just don't want to price it, but then the answer is we'll just sign the safe note and be in the deal and we'll let someone else price it uh, later. What was the second question? It was hockey sticks, I believe. And the, the, the key there is um, if you have a hockey stick, you really need to have evidence that it really is working already. Uh, it's best to show something a little bit more organically growing uh, up the curve. So if you're growing at a 30% clip, just keep the 30% keep the clip going in the slides. We don't have to put a hockey stick because <clears throat> most investors are not going to buy into that. And but if you have a good 25, 30 percent growth rate, they'll buy into that. They'll they'll believe that. And that's enough to get them to go into it. So I would avoid the hockey sticks because most most businesses really can't survive that that much growth in one year anyway. So that's how we would do that. Uh, I have a question regarding the deck and keeping it visually appearing uh, appealing, excuse me. Sure. What do you think about the use of video? And, and I ask because we've got a, a very simple 90 second video that thoroughly explains our technology mm -hmm. and the problem. It's very effective. We've got a, a fairly challenging scientific chemical process that, that we utilize. It's our, pro our, our product, but it's very difficult to explain quickly. And this video does a nice job. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know if it would be a distraction and nobody's going to look at it or if that's a, a better way to go about it. Right. I find videos work well if you're using it as part of your presentation. You're showing the video, and instead of the video explaining, you're explaining. You're talking over it as it's going through. And so since it's your presentation, you're going through the slides, and you're going through the video, the video gives you the visuals, but you maintain, turn off the volume, but you, you actually do the voiceover to explain what's working. And then that kind of fits into the format of the slides. If you stop talking and turn on the video, and you know I've seen guys go over and get a cup of coffee while the video is playing, it, it just doesn't seem like we're, we're doing the same thing anymore. We're, it was a pitch, but now we're watching TV. Now we're going back to a pitch, and it, it just doesn't fit in very well. Most detailed videos also work better uh, in advance of the meeting, send them the video to watch it before they come, or to send it as a follow-up to, to watch afterwards to give yourself, give, give, give yourself something to give them to do before and after the uh, presentation is another option if you have that. So I, I like videos. I think the technology is there now. I used to tell people do not put videos up there because we spent half their your airtime just jacking with the encoders and trying to get the mic to work and it was just a real mess today if it's all online with zoom you know video is really not an issue anymore uh, but i do think the format is 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 off there it really should be you driving the pitch not uh, delegating it over to the video and back so those are just some thoughts there about how videos might or may not work for you there thank you oh cool any other questions we have here today? I have a uh, quick question for you. Now, this is a specific uh, work with a, a medical device. 
uh, companies who are, who are trying to raise money for for that side. So it's kind of a little different than you know the the tech based. But um, we just we've been hearing some conflicting um, information recently, and I don't know if, if you know specifically with with investors. Um, ours is a respiratory device. And of course, a lot of people on, on their minds right now is COVID. When they hear respiratory, they're thinking COVID. Ours does address that, but we don't want to be short-sighted and only talk about COVID and, and of course, you know, limit our limit ourselves. But because it's much, you know, further reaching than that, um, do you think there's any any risk of of just because we've heard like, oh, well, you should use it, you know, while we have a chance. People are thinking about COVID. We should just use that and push the COVID aspect to get money, to get investment, to, to get this, get towards FDA clearance where we're trying to reach. Or um, we've heard other side where investors are, they hear COVID and they, they turn their, you know, they turn their ears off and they're like, nope, I don't, I don't want to hear it. It's short-sighted. This is going to go away in a year or two and, and we're, we're going to move on. Do you have any ideas with that um, of, of debacle? Well, well, typically you want the you want a platform based product, a product that does more than just one thing. So it, it, the idea is you you would I would list COVID and then I would list the other things that are up there. I'd put COVID first, but I put the other things that we're doing. If you're going after you know reimbursement codes that are specific to COVID, uh, you have to think about that. If you're going after codes that are more encompassing and include COVID, that seemed like the better option because now you get reimbursement for any respiratory, not just COVID. So it seemed like that might come in at the reimbursement uh, code level itself. And so if you're designing the product, it seemed like you would you know, build a platform. And if there's a, a, you know, the ability to do more than just COVID, I would, I would do those. I'd make it a broader product myself. But in all the slides I would put up there, number one, you know, COVID's a big market. We're going after COVID, and that's part of it. But but not not uh, take take myself out of the ability to do other respiratory illnesses as well, and see where what the imp, what, where where the real trade offs are there. Like I say, product design and then reimbursement codes are the two I'm thinking of. Are there any other trade offs you're seeing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's definitely um, the the two big. Things with uh, reimbursement is, is definitely a huge, yeah, huge market. Right. I, I would go after the bigger market, and uh, yeah. but but in the marketing of it, you can always emphasize COVID enough to make clear, you know, we're you know COVID is going to be a big driver. It's going to be around for more than a year, uh, as we see with the variants. Some say it's up to seven years. So right. I would right. I would get some data showcasing that COVID is really not over uh we we did we all, we all thought that in july but we nobody's thinking that exactly. anymore it's really exactly. going to be around for a while with variants and so there'll be plenty of time to go do both in this case is my my coaching okay thank you cool paul we had a question circling back to the uh, hockey topic so any different feelings if the hockey stick is driven by anticipated growth via a franchising concept or business model well, the, the issue with a hockey stick is, you know, everything has to line up. Your financial projections have to line up with that. Your fundraise projections have to line up with that. Your sales projections have to line up with that. And so typically when you start hockey sticking, uh, if it does come true, you're going to have to hire a lot of people. You have to sell a lot of franchises. You have to raise a lot of funding in some cases to keep up with it. Yes, franchising, they're putting the money in, but you're also having to support them with many services and supports that cost you money. So the thing you want to do is go through and make sure your financials align with that hockey stick and then start looking at your fundraise requirements that come out of it and the people requirements. The way you do fundraising is you put a pin in the, the map today, here's where we are with revenue and team. And then five years out, put a pin where you want to be draw a line from one to the other. And what falls out of that is your hiring plan and your fundraise plan. And so if you have a hockey stick at year four, we'll draw the pin and draw the line and see how much funding do you need to raise to actually support that business? Is that something you can do or want to do? And sometimes you'll find that, you know, you really don't want to do that. I really rather just have it grow a little bit more organically over time. Uh, how many of these, uh, franchises can we really stand up you, you have to take applications you have to qualify people they have to get funding they have to grow and so forth and 
how much of your time do you have to really sustain that as well? Just because you could sell that many units doesn't mean you should, because when you get too high a growth rate, you know, the wheels come off the business. It's just, it's just too much growth. There's too much going on. So I would look at the other aspects to see, does everything line up to be able to support that? Can you raise that much money? Can you hire that many people? Today's market, you know, the challenge is finding talent. Uh, you used to ask people what the challenge is with the startup. They say uh, it's raising funding. Today, it's finding talent. So can you find enough talent to do that? So I'm not sure I would pro project it very much that way because, again, to raise funding, you don't really have to have a huge hockey stick in one year. Having good, steady growth over several years can also be very compelling, too. Another question we had was, what is the best means to find and approach the right VC investors, uh, especially stage and industry specific, considering the amount of VCs and investors that are out there. So what was the uh, best way to approach VCs? <laughs> what was the That's best way to find and approach the right okay. VC investors for you? Okay. Yeah. So step one is uh, identify the right investors, research the investors and figure out who's in your revenue sector stage and criteria who's funding deals that you think are relevant to what you're doing. So you're in their, your sweet spot. Half the deals that come to a VC uh, are outside their criteria, do not meet their investment thesis. So if you research it, you know, half of them go away right there because they're, they're, they're investing in something else. Uh, second is, is talk to their portfolio companies and then see if they will give you a recommendation. How was it working with that VC? What did they help you with? How did it go? And then when you find a good answer to that, well, then the next question is, can you, Mr. Portfolio Company, help make an introduction for me and see if they will do that? And that's the best way to reach a VC is through a trusted connection and a portfolio of a VC is a trusted connection. And at some point in doing diligence on a VC, you want to talk to the portfolios anyway. So you want to be reaching out to those guys sooner rather than later to find out uh, if they can, if it was a good thing and if it matches what you want, how much support you want, how much funding you want, how much follow-up funding do you want, what kind of expertise you want. All of those are the questions you want to ask that portfolio to see how much they delivered and are they the right fit. And then next is to focus in on those groups. It's better to find 10 of those then and focus on them for a period of time rather than a hundred where half of them don't fit the criteria and they, they don't work for you. So <clears throat> that, that's the way you do it is to know who you want to go talk to first and then qualify them and then get the introduction from those who are helping you qualify it. Cool. Uh, are there any other questions at this point? So Hall, this is Glenn Hyman. I've been, feeding a lot of those questions. Just, just a couple of follow-up things. Obviously, you, know, you can spend eons of hours trying to do research. Um, I, I happen to find Crunchbase to be uh, a, a fairly good source. Um, sometimes just looking at the local business journal, I'm in the Philadelphia area, so seeing Philadelphia Business Journal or something that might pop up in the local paper that then leads me to um, finding some, some potential VCs or angel funding groups, et cetera. But besides Crunchbase and some of the other things that I just mentioned, um, you know, where else would you suggest to research to find the right VCs? And um, I, I know, again, in Philadelphia anyway, so, some law firms are very supportive of startups and entrepreneurs. What are your thoughts with regard to law firms and accounting firms to also help you find the right fit? I think, I think law firms and accounting firms are good sources. I think uh, they, they know some contacts and it's a great way to go. I also find, think that you, you run out of local resources pretty quick in, in any city, even the big cities, you, you will run out of them at some point. And I think you have to have a national view on your fundraise from day one. You have to be thinking much broader. You do need to get funding locally first. You, you never want to show up and say, hey, nobody back home would give me money. How about you? That's a kiss of death. But you do want to be able to raise some money, but it's only going to go a little bit of ways forward. 
from it. And those who did put money in are also sources of recommendations. Who else do they think you should go talk to? But I would also look at other sources like CB Insights and PitchBook and some of the other ones out there to find more similar investors to what you what your target is, what your ideal investor is that's in your revenue sector and stage. There's quite a bit of data out there on those investors. So if you research them a little bit more and look at the companies in your industry who are who's funding them, that's also on pitch uh, on these services like Crunchbase and try to go at it from that angle. Like I say, I wouldn't limit it to a local area after I exhausted local resources, which you sh should do, you know, after that you go national. There's 4,000 micro VCs out there right now, each with a very unique investment thesis. So you want to do a bit more research on those guys to see if they're a good fit for your deal, the revenue sector stage type, that's that, that type of thing. And then if you find the name of the VC that you think is a candidate, you look on their website for their portfolios and then start to see, are these companies similar to what I'm doing or how are they similar to what I'm doing? Because oftentimes you can look at their investment thesis and figure out uh, they're looking at uh, some particular aspect. And then you have to ask yourself, do I meet that aspect that they're, they're keying off of for these investments? So there, there's several ways to go after it, but those are some that I would think about as well. Go national and go look at some of the more of the other analytic services that are available. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions out there? We're getting near the end of our time. Appreciate you guys coming on today. If there's any other questions, let me know. We'll be back next month with another session. In between time, check out our website, 10capital.group. We have an education page with e-guides on each of these topics, how to uh, write a pitch deck, uh, about six calculators. If you want to try out several of them, just try different, see what valuations come out based on what you have. <laughs> It'll start to give you an idea of, of what uh, and how investors might be looking at your deal. And it may be fair game to uh, improve the deal to a point where you can get a better valuation. I'd say half the seed companies I know go raise a seed round with the intention of doing a series A the next year. Half of them come back saying they're going to do a seed plus round. That means another five, 750 K at the previous round valuation because they can't get the valuation that they want for their series A. And so they have to work on the business uh, to improve the, the metrics on it in order to get to where they can raise that round as well. Um, we had another question there, Fred. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is um, a question that I've never been able to get an answer to. So uh, we have a few larger customer, one particularly large who is considering investing in uh, the company, but they also want to be a customer. And part of the discussion is if they invest, can they invest at a more advantageous valuation if they get a discount on, on or severe discount on, on the product, on the platform? Would you advise against that? Is this a artificial valuation then? Is it frowned upon? Is it even legal? Um, does that make sense? Right. So if the customer is really strategic, uh, if they can really add value by having their name on the cap table and they can open doors for other people, and there, there are some corporate VCs that are that way, they, they really make a big difference. It's worth doing. Then it's worth doing. Uh, if they're not, then what I would do is, and this is what happens with many of these company investments, is that they, uh, the investment kind of goes away and they just start buying the product. And now they become a customer reference instead of a venture capital reference. And so it just depends on how, how, how much you really, how much value you really put on having them on your cap table. If you really need a lead investor to close other investors, it may be worth it. If they have a big name, it may be worth it. If they don't have a big name and they're really not adding any more value than dollars, then I would just shift it over to, well, let's just, let's just uh, sell you more product. We'll give you a discount, but not as deep as you were thinking about, but we'll give you a little bit of a discount. So you're a good, but we want you to be a good customer reference in this case and not, not lose the revenue in this case. Cause that, that is the challenge with taking an investment from a customer is that they want to trade off the price of the product for the investment. 
And that's, that's usually not a good trade-off. Usually you need all the revenue you can get from the, that customer in order to grow the business. Otherwise you're, you're struggling to make the next customer work because you didn't get enough revenue from the last customer. So I look harder at the value that that investment brings to you beyond just the dollars. How about follow-up investors? Could, could this, um, could this be problematic for follow-up investors who look at that initial investment and say, wait, wait a minute, that, that valuation doesn't make sense, even though that big company invested in your, in your company. Right. Well, you know, they have to have a meaningful valuation, uh, coming in. I, I think we were talking about taking discounts on the product you were selling, but they were going to come in at a standard valuation. If they're trying to get a lower valuation because they're a customer, no, the other uh, way around. They would they would get a, a hot, they would be okay investing on the higher valuation if they got a discount on the product. And, and you have to look at how much of a discount that is. If that's too steep, then then I'm looking at more than just the valuation. I'm looking at what that investment brings me with reputation, follow-on funding, other investors, that type of thing. Uh, and if they really have that, if that's going to really help drive other investors to come in, then I would consider it in most cases, that's really not the case. They, they don't have a big name. They don't have a big reputation. They just, just trying to make a buck. Well then no, no, we don't want to do that. They're not, there's not, you're going to give yourself problems with other investors and it could put the cap table in a funny place. And we don't want to do that as well. Too much dilution early on is a, is a big problem with some of these deals. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Any, any other questions, Yadi? Um, <clears throat> what would you consider is a maximum equity um, share to, to give away in a first um, investment round? Uh, you want to be in the 20 to 25% range. Uh, if it's anything above 25%, then we're, we're raising less money. Uh, we can, we can just go down to the minimum. You know, the first raise could be the minimum you can raise at, in this world is 250 K. You do less than 250 K investors will question if you can really do anything. Uh, but you can do something with 250 K and you just take the absolute minimum amount of money, uh, which is 250, if it's too far above 25% uh, dilution uh, of, of the equity. And then you want to try to keep it in the 20, 25% range going forward. And as you get higher, go down to 20. But that that's the rule is don't, don't take, you know, if, if the valuation is just not as good, well, then either walk away from the money or just take the, the bare minimum and go, go build something and then come back six months later and, and, try again with a different group of people because now you've got more team, more product, and you're at a different place and more experience, maybe more connections. So that's what you want to do is not, not get yourself diluted too much on the first round. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, we're at the end of our time. Thank you guys for joining today. We'll send you those templates and other tools. And we'll hope to see you on the uh, next side. If you have any questions, email them to us and happy to answer them as we go along and uh, appreciate you guys taking time to join us today. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Thanks. Much appreciated.